Okay, this is going to be the first part for the review of cubic and cube root functions. Uh, my goal here is just to get through the front side of the review, which is mostly the, uh, or maybe all of just the graphing things are here, and then I'll do a second video for the back part. Okay, the beginning, you have two different types of functions you're going to be asked to graph. You have the cubed function, and you also have the cubed root function, which for the most part, they're kind of the same function, just sideways. So if you know your patterns in the in the parent function, um, just turn it sideways when you do this. As a suggestion, one thing that you could do from the very beginning is when you see like what function it is, so we know this is a cubed, just sketch the parent function off to the side. Just have it as reference so you don't get tripped up and just draw the wrong one and, and then later tell me that that was a, a silly error that you did there. Okay, and this being the cube root, the parent function looks roughly like that. That's the, the pattern that falls. Okay, now for graphing, what I would want you to do is identify the point of symmetry first. So you're looking for those H's and, uh, and K values that are in there. In the first, you're going to have a horizontal shift of four units to the right, but you don't have any vertical. So that's going to put the point of symmetry right here. And you're going to notice that I drew these vertical and horizontal lines in, and I did this for the last unit as well. Because once you have that, uh, that location, here's the point of symmetry, once you have that point found, the A values and the B values can't do anything to that point. They're actually just going to expand and compress and flip all around that location. Okay. Now for ours, the only thing that we have here is this 3 fourths that's going on. So that, that's going to be a vertical compression. 3 fourths is less than 1, so it's going to actually shrink it down. Okay, we think about our parent function then from this point. The, uh, the original first point over would be 1 and then up 1. Okay, the cube root of 1 is 1. Okay, and then your next one would be two points from the point of symmetry up eight units, which is gonna be off of my chart here, but that actually ends up being the point that I wanna use because that height of eight, I can easily um, adjust to three-fourths of its height because you can divide the eight by four and get two, multiply it by three and get six. In other words, six is gonna be three-fourths of the eight. Okay, and then as far as the other point, Yes, this is going to be at three-fourths, and you can put a little dot there if you want. Okay, but for testing, um, when we're grading this, we're going to want to see that point. We're going to want to see the, that solid point that you can get. And now, since that is a point of symmetry, look, it's the same pattern going this way. You go two, and then you can drop down six units. So you know that's all reflected. Okay, so we should get... That's not a great picture over here on the side, but we should definitely... Erase that. You'll notice I didn't even quite hit that point, right? It doesn't have to be that great. But what we want to see is the point of symmetry. We want to see this. It's called an inflection point, where it kind of curves in and out of that spot. And we definitely want to see at the end of these that that's taking off pretty much a vertical, and now it's pretty much a vertical in the down direction. And of course, all that's true for the uh, cube root, but sideways. Okay, so the cube root function, um, notice that I rewrote wrote this here, um, change it up just a little bit. And you might not even like pay much attention to it, but I need you to be aware. If there's something happening with the B value and you've got some shifting, you better write it where it's got parentheses because you've got to separate how we interpret that point of symmetry location versus the compressing. You need to know where the symmetry is before you can compress or flip. This is a flip here. Yeah, so when I factor out that minus, that negative, it actually turns that into a negative two. And ultimately, that's just going to put you on the the, the right location for the graph, left and right. Okay, so we're going to be at a 2 and a negative 3. Out 2 and then down 3. That's my point of symmetry. Okay, uh, beyond that, you know, this is our parent function. Remember, I wrote that up there so I didn't forget what it looks like. The only thing that's going to change is that you've got this negative hanging out inside, and that's a horizontal flip. So instead of going over 1 and up 1 here, I'll just take it backwards. Okay, and then your next is going to be this eight units over, so that would be at, at negative six, but up a couple from where we're at. So we end up here. Um, you end up with the same same pattern on the other side. So let's see if I can sketch this. There we go. Yeah, so again, we want that end behavior where it looks like it's going pretty much horizontal. We should see that inflection that's happening in the middle as well. All right, next are description type problems where we want you to write equations. Um, let's see. In our first, we want a cube function. Okay, so that really shouldn't make 
I guess it does make a difference when, if you're going to imagine the graphs when you're doing these things. But um, if you want, you could, you know, sketch this little guy here. Just as a reminder, maybe that'll help out. Uh, most of these, you don't really need the grids to draw them. Just kind of think of the structure of the equation. And we're going to give you hints to uh, what stuff is going to be there. Okay, now at the beginning, this says that the points, this and that, they're going to be collinear with the point of symmetry. Well, the point of symmetry is always going to be collinear with two other points. That's just what it is. It's the midpoint of them as well. So when I give you these two points, what I'm actually doing is allowing you to find their midpoint and make that your point of symmetry. So the middle of the 3 and the 5 is a 4. Right between negative 5 and 3 is going to be a negative 1. So horizontally, it's going to be at 4. And then vertically, the point of symmetry is going to be down one unit, halfway between those numbers if you were to imagine them on the graph. And you can do that off to the side for it. So these numbers then end up being my point of symmetry. You just have to take the opposite for your x value when it goes in. So you get a minus 4. and um, yeah, and then that number just goes to the end, so it's minus 5. Okay, going with the rest of this, the graph is vertically stretched. That means I'm going to use an A value greater than 1. And then I stated here that there is no other transformation. So we don't have any flipping that's um, occurring here. We definitely don't have any B values. So when I started to write all this up, I had that part, I had that part. And then the rest of this tells me don't put anything there. Don't even pretend there's something there. But let's put an A in. And now I can take an approach other than graphing to actually get this answer. I can take the equation that I have so far and grab one of these coordinates. Let's take this guy because it's all positive and just plug it in. Okay, so I'm going to make the x a 5. There's my cubed. That's what. Then I'm just going to start working things out. This is going to give me 1, and 1 cubed is 1. So I end up with 3 is equal to a minus 1. Right? All that is just 1, so it turns out to be an a. And now if I add the 1 over, it tells me that my a value is 4. So in the end, your equation is going to be y equals 4 times x minus 4 cubed minus 1. And I didn't have to graph it, which I think is neat. I can actually just create a skeleton to this whole thing, luckily here, because you only had one other number to, to work with, and then I solve for it. Uh, we can do something similar like that in number 4 as well. Okay, in 3, we're doing the cube root functions. So here's a general template. I uh, haven't talked about why I've got the a and the b value in here yet. But the translating part here, saying that we're moving to the left 8, tells me I need a plus 8 in parentheses with the x, because there will be a b value. You're going to go up 2, so great, got my plus 2. Um, it is vertically and horizontally flipped, but not stretched or compressed. Okay, so what that means is that the a value is still a 1. It's not going to be a 2 or a 1 half or any of that. And the same thing about the b. Yet, something is going to go in those places because it is being vertically and horizontally flipped. So we want to see if you put negatives here. And again, notice the parentheses because that does make a difference when we do this, that you have the parentheses around it. Now, some of you who are really clever, you'll probably have figured out, or maybe one of your teachers have told you that, if you cube root a negative number, the answer is negative. So really, the negatives do cancel out each other. It is possible to write the equation just like this. Um, and it graphs the exact same picture. However, I would want to see this because based on the description, that's how the instructions are written, based on the description, this is the equation that we want to see. So I'm going to be clear that if you know it does that, please at least write that one first so that we know that you've You've done that. And that's a unique thing with this unit and the cube roots and cubing things that we didn't have with the square roots. Okay, last for this video. Um, this is going to refer to the cube functions that look like that, where it's got these extra little bends in it that'd be there. Here's your template. We're all, you're going to start here. As soon as you see this factored form thing that we want, I want you to write this. I want you to have the A. I want you to have the three sets of parentheses. Put some X's in the front of them. Okay. All right, then you're going to be given some roots here. Uh, by the way, we don't have a huge variety on how we're going to do these problems, so you can really just follow these rules. Okay, you have a single root at x equals 1.5. And that's a little bit weird as a, as a decimal, but an easy, safe way to deal with it is just to use that number. Now, I'll show you when we're done with this. There's another way you can write it, but I think this is going to be the, the quicker way and 
to get it all in. Okay, now your roots are the numbers that make the zero. So when it goes in here, it becomes the opposite because you want that to be the 1.5. And when it subtracts, give you a zero. Okay, we also have a double root at negative four. That means you get two x plus fours. And then there's one other piece of the equation that could be different and it doesn't affect where the roots are. And that would be another factor that is um, either stretching it or compressing it vertically around the x-axis. Okay, we can't add or subtract anything to the end. It's the only spot that we have to work with. So now you're given the y-intercept. And technically, you can be given any coordinate to do this part. But if we give you the y-intercept, we're being really nice because, let's see here, when you plug in a 0, you just get that number that you wrote. So you got negative 1.5, you got a 4, and another 4. And, um, and of course, I forgot something because I got two variables in here, but I was plugging in the 0 for the x's, which means I should have also have been plugging in a negative 8 for the y value. And notice we got that one variable. So let's just multiply all this together. See how it compares to the negative 8. Okay, so you got negative 8. Uh, let's see, that's mm, okay, 16. There's going to be a negative. We know that. So it's negative. Um, there's going to be an a value. Okay, you got 16 multiplied by 1.5. So that's 16 and another half. That's going to give you um, 24. Okay, and then when you divide, make sure you do it the right way because you want to get the a by itself. You got to divide by the negative 24. That's actually going to give you one third, and that's your a value. Okay, let me see if I can pull it all together here and make it look nice. The a value is going to be one third. Then you just rewrite all these parentheses that you've got. Uh, and, and you know what? If you want to look real cool. And you just put a little 2 right there. That's great. Okay, now I mentioned slightly earlier, there's a different way that you can write this one here. That factor could actually be written as... Uh, let's see if I get these right. Um, I think it's going to be a 2 minus 1. No, 3... I think that's the guy. Winging it right now, so we'll see. Okay, because if you put a negative one half in here, two times 1.5 is gonna give you the three. Okay, well, it's plugging in 1.5. If you put 1.5 in, you get a three, and three minus three will give you zero. And you usually see things look like this when it's factored, but the problem is, is that if you have it set up like this, uh, you're going to get a slightly different a value for your equation. You're going to get a different one because you're going to keep the 3, and that's going to go away when you plug in the 0. So you're going to get a, a, a different a value in there. So my suggestion would be just with these decimals is not get too fancy with them and, and change that, but just uh, put it in as it is, and, and this is fine. We'll take it.